Good morning. Thank you very much. Really, thank you, um, Foresight Institute and Protocol Labs, Foresight Institute in particular, because it's been a long journey getting to DSI. And Foresight, Alex, Lou, uh, Ellison, you've really been instrumental in my life, even though you probably don't realize it. So in the spirit of creating data to train our large language model, which will be ingesting all the information that I'm uh, talking about today, I create a somewhat dense presentation where I want to give you an overview, give you a journey into decentralized science from my perspective so far, and how we're applying it to solve topics in neurodegeneration and neuroscience with Cerebrum DAO, as well as other bio DAOs that are coming out to uh, highlight some of the new cool projects and how I think they're really going to make the world a better place. Quick point on me, I was younger when I had uh, portraits, DSI and Neurotech made me older. So I'm trying to create uh, brain health solutions to uh, uh, improve my brain health as I'm getting older. I develop brain computer interface earbuds at Eden Technologies in Switzerland. So we develop a very small BCI. Um, we'll be talking about that in the next talk on Friday. And in, in addition to that, through Foresight Institute and Neurotech X, uh, I've really been trying to dive into Neurotech and understand like what's the best way to solve different problems in neuroscience, whether it's through product development or decentralized science or academic research. And I hope I've come to a happy medium between product development and also DSI development. Full disclosure, I do own uh, various DSI tokens. So if I'm saying something positive about a project, I guess I do have a financial incentive. Uh, but who here is already diving into science? Is science broken? Yeah? What, what, what's the broken part of science? Hmm, that's a good one. Love that one. The centralization of funding, the... And it's See, I love Warren because he says all this cool stuff and I don't get it the first time I have to think about it. But he's like one of the smartest people that I, I, I've been talking to this week. Politicization of science. Yeah, just like, just the, like political distortions in funding that mm. One of the things coming up for me as well, a couple of years ago when I started to think about DSI, what's the problems, uh, how we can solve solutions. And also at any point, if you have ideas, feel free to throw up a hand and throw out your ideas so we can all bring it together into the final language model because we're all learning how to DSI at this point in time. I fundamentally think that like science as itself, like the scientific process isn't broken, right? We start with questions, we do experiments, we try to understand or quote unquote discover things about the world, whether it's uh, physics or biology or the brain. And then we try to publish, communicate, so we can actually use that knowledge, information for something. Now, sometimes the politicization of science could mean that you can only do science if you have the money to do science, right? I got a PhD because I like Switzerland and I wanted to be able to do stuff with um, smart materials and mechanical engineering. And I couldn't really do that in my room. I needed, you know, I wanted to work in a lab, have support, you know, to, to make that stuff happen. Um, but I oftentimes talk to people who have ideas for science, sometimes really good ideas, like creating um, large language models from organoids and really trying to push the boundaries of what we can do with AI and technology. But you know, they don't want to do a PhD program and it doesn't always make sense to do a PhD. So I think one thing with DSI is opening up the possibility for you know, going from an idea to really implementing uh, the thing that you want to explore, the thing that you want to do. Um, I've worked in academia, I've worked in projects like innovation projects in Switzerland where we try to take stuff from the lab and put it into a product in a startup company. Uh, it doesn't always work super well, but in principle, we want to research. And once we, once we actually have something that's working reliably, I mean, this is a technology, right? Uh, a technology is something that can be copied, can be scaled, can be turned into products through product design. And these are things that actually impact everyone's lives. Uh, the battery I have here, this cable, I don't know how many like hours, days, maybe half a year went to, into the cable design of this uh, charger that's making my laptop work. 
But we run into roadblocks with science to transition, to translate from idea to technology to a spin-off or into a scalable product. And a lot of this is also based on how we allocate resources, right? Um, we don't always know what problem we need to solve at which point in time. And it's sometimes frustrating going through the research and innovation stages as we like to use these cool buzzwords. Because at different points in time, you have to ask different people for money to make stuff happen, right? Um, if you're doing a PhD, you have to ask the lab. When I was a master's student, I wanted to start printing basically bioceramics using a uh, powder-based 3D printer. This is like 25, 30 years ago? No, 25 years ago. Yeah, it was pretty novel, but you know, my uh, professor at the time wasn't expecting that I would need $35,000 to buy a 3D printer. Uh, so that thing didn't happen at that point in time, unfortunately. Maybe, you know, if it was today, I could more easily go out, ask someone for $300,000 seed round, and then just buy the printer and start doing the, the, the experiments on my own. Um, and then it's frustrating for researchers because they're used to writing grants and then publishing our papers. And now if they want to spin off this technology into a company, oh, now I have to understand how to talk to venture capitalists, and I have to understand a whole other language of company valuation instead of publication numbers, which is how researchers are traditionally valued in a scientific institution. So we, we have all these very structured uh, silos for going from idea to discovery to product to innovation to things that actually impact people's lives, and that's probably one of those frustrating things um, that I've been experiencing in, in my life, and I think also from many other people. So we also know that when we are funding science at the, the research level or the national level, um, we have to have people who have agreed at, some, at the NIH or in other organizations that, hey, this is the right time to put money into nanotechnology. This is the right time to put money into neurotech and neuroscience because we're having so many problems with neurodegeneration and we know that in 10 years, we're going, this is gonna be an even bigger problem. So we are basically siloing how we're spending money. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest things that I thought would be cool to address or solve with decentralized science projects, decentralization of funding, decentralization of resources, and then it started to grow from there. Um, one way I got into DSI was working on a tech tree project for the Foresight Institute a couple of years ago. And we wanted to map out neurotechnology. What's the, the technology tree for neurotechnology? Because if we can understand the technology and the applications, we understand bottlenecks, we can start to chart the solution pathway, right? Now we know where we need to put money. Now we know who we have to hire to solve like really big problems. And this is what other company or other organizations are going to be doing. I think Schmidt Futures, when they're creating focused research organizations, they're also looking at this type of uh, thinking exercise. But at the end of the day, what is this? It's, um, it's a nice matrix. It's a, it's a graph. It's a knowledge graph, right? This is a big, uh, cool buzzword uh, coming up quite a bit in artificial intelligence circles, the idea that we don't just have unstructured data, but we have structured data and structured thoughts that can then help to inform AI models or agents on how to go forward and build stuff. Um, the technology tree was led by Marina Parayukova and also Russell Hansen and Sebastian Volk were working on this back at the time when I was involved in the project. And now I think it's been expanding out quite a bit with the evolution of large language models and AI. And this is really where I think we have to ask the question, um, how do we do decentralized science? Um, I've been involved in a few different DAOs. Uh, first, CureDAO, which was actually using Filecoin. I don't know if Clara is still here. But it was a really cool project to understand how we want to uh, start collecting patient data in a DAO uh, infrastructure and then build out a product from it. It was also very complicated. It was like creating a, a new startup, and ultimately they didn't do a, a token launch or really go forward into taking the project to the next step, but it was a very good learning curve coming into Cerebrum DAO. 
So just as a quick overview, Cerebrum DAO, we're a DAO focused on neuroscience and solving problems in neurodegeneration. Uh, we call ourselves a community power, a network organization, as all DAOs are. So we're essentially a collection of people, we have a governance structure, and we want to improve the brain. We want our, we, you know, we're in a situation oftentimes as we go through aging processes where our brain might still be cognizant, um, but our body is starting to fall apart or vice versa, right? We're, so through longevity and also through neuroscience, we're trying to really understand how we can improve brain health throughout the, the lifetime of a person. And that's a relatively large overarching theme. But the, the key thing for Cerebrum, as with many um, DSI projects or bio DAOs, is that we think that there's a translation gap, a funding gap, which is preventing a lot of great solutions from coming into the product marketplace for people to really be impacted by them. So going from bench to bedside, you know, how can we really help to improve the way that we're developing new products that are enhancing our brain health and resisting neurodegeneration? And you've probably heard actually all these topics already at different points in time, either today or yesterday. Um, we're creating more data. Um, when we create a lot of MRI scans or EEG scans in one part of the world, it's not gonna be necessarily accessible to a researcher in another part of the world. So research groups can intentionally or unintentionally um, silo data that people could use to do experiments. There's also a lot of initiatives to create open data sets from different research groups. So we know we're going towards a, a place where I think we have access to a lot of the information and the purpose of these DAOs is really to help facilitate how to develop things better and faster. Also one of the cool things got introduced to is the concept of the intellectual property, a non-fungible token, IP NFTs. So right now, and I'll talk about this in more in a second with roadmaps, a lot of the, the bio DAOs or the DSI DAOs, we start as organizations that are trying to address this uh, translation gap. One way to do this is by offering funding in exchange for fractionalized intellectual property. So if a researcher is working on a new uh, cure for Alzheimer's, we can provide funding at a certain stage to help accelerate. And in exchange for that, we'd be getting a fractional ownership of the IP which could later be sold or licensed to other people who are building products or pharmaceuticals. So that's the basic thesis that a lot of uh, DSI DAOs have right now. We've started funding projects, we're starting to launch a lot of this stuff, but as you know, with investment, in any type of investment, um, it's not a one year thing, it's not a two year thing, it's not a three year thing, it's probably gonna be a five to eight year thing. But it's really cool because to do an IP NFT, you can have an impact with funding um, with relatively little resource allocation, right? Because it's a Web3 product, you can have a minting of a NFT connected to the IP, transfer money to the researcher, and so this is one very easy way to do DSI because you're addressing the funding gap. But I was really interested in thinking beyond the funding gap. Uh, so I spent a lot of time thinking about different DSI architecture is thinking about what we can really do with uh, bio DAOs or DSI DAOs. And I started to put this together in different notes that I have probably basically translated into this presentation. So the goal is that if anyone else wants to create a DAO, I want to help facilitate knowledge sharing and, and roadmap so you can understand how to do that most effectively. Because I think more DAOs, more decentralized uh, science institutions can ideally improve the way that we're doing science. Uh, so I think one of the most important things when we think about how to DSI is think about what's the, the purpose of the DAO that you're going to launch or undertake. What is the community that's coming around that's actually part of this organization? And then how do you implement and how do you build? Depending on your goal, there is a vastly different number of resources you might need Right? If you're starting to create invasive simulation devices because you want to improve the way that people are recovering from spinal surgery, uh, that's gonna be a lot different than creating a supplement or a pharmaceutical. And we now see a lot of the DSI DAOs coming out with funding focuses, 
but now moving towards data, but also publishing, and we already talked about the, the IP uh, generation. So the cool thing is that these different DAOs are forming themselves to solve these different problems that we have in science, um, and doing it in a very decentralized way from the ground up, as opposed to having the, the top-down uh, politicized version that we started with. But it, you know, fundamentally, I think it always comes down to, are we asking the right questions at the right time? And are we um, allocating our resources effectively? Whether you're a research group or a startup company or a large company, I'm sure we've all worked in large organizations uh, where we can't always do the things we want to do, make the right decisions at the right time, and use our resources as effectively as possible. So for me personally, this is one thing that I want to try and solve uh, with DSIDAO infrastructures. So very easily, first define a purpose. And then you can launch a DAO. Launching a DAO can be, well, creating a Discord with uh, your name, dash DAO. Uh, create a little website where you can show people what you're doing, what you're building. For most people, it then comes down to creating deal flow processes, launching a token so you can build your treasury, which is analogous to launching a seed round as a, as a startup. Uh, the big difference is that you're not selling shares or providing uh, exchange of equity for money, you're doing it through a token. And that's usually a governance token so that people who own that token can have a say in how that DAO is making decisions. Um, now that we have had a lot of DSI DAOs launch over the past couple of years, we're getting to the point where DAOs like VitaDAO have been really instrumental in setting up a great example for how to do deal flow. But now we're moving towards product building, right? If we want to extend the, the lifetime of a DAO, you know, I, I don't want to just think about a DAO within the framework of like one year or half a year and just launching a token and building a treasury and then maybe doing an exit as an investor. I want to think about what are we doing in two years from now, three years from now. I think it will be really amazing if there are at least more than one DAOs over the next uh, 10 to 100 years they're still continuously innovating and are still growing and providing value as a community. And that's really the, 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 the thing we'll probably figure out over the next five to 10 years, which DAOs are really continuing to build and like being self-sufficient and which ones were great ideas but then died. Or let's say they didn't die, it's just nobody trades their token anymore and then you know, essentially the value of it goes away. Um, and I would love to get to the point where certain DAOs, uh, you know, it, much in the same way that focused research organizations have a set time period to, to be alive, and then they get dissolved after a set number of years, I look forward to the time when some DSI DAOs start uh, dissolving because we've solved longevity through VitaDAO, <laughs> or we've solved uh, other problems in neurodegeneration, or uh, the multitude of other things that are coming up. Um, so, as a uh, as a designer, and this is a lot of what I do uh, in my job doing uh, BCI development, understanding purpose, understanding where your DAO sits within the whole ecosystem is obscenely important. Because if you don't understand why your DAO is there, you know, why, why should people be joining it? Are, are you really allocating the resources in the best way possible to launch this DAO? Or is this just something that you want to do because it's Sounds cool to launch a DAO. Um, by the way, same thing if you're launching a company. Uh, probably good to do it for the, for the right reasons. Um, and the, the, the strategizer is a really great document because it allows you to take a sort of a multi-dimensional view uh, to the way that you're solving a problem or going to solve a problem with, with your DAO. Really key thing is to also understand what partnerships you think are going to be needed Right? Even if you have 1,000 people, 10,000 people on a Discord or a Telegram group, uh, there's going to be a smaller number of people who are really engaged at different parts of the process. And this is also one of the huge challenges that we're going to have over the next couple of years, keeping engagement of people, which is going to happen through compensation policies within different DAOs, and also then launching products or creating things that people within the broader community can interact with. And when you, when you have this as a, as a workshop output or as a discussion point with, that you can have with your team, it's super useful because it can also be a living document, right? This can live on a mural, a mural or a miro 
or one of the other uh, online whiteboarding apps. Google also works very well for this. And it can help keep you focused on where you need to go, what decisions you need to make, and really what impact you think you're gonna have. So for Cerebrum DAO, for example, uh, focusing on a, like measuring and really impacting the brain health journey of a person over the course of their life is the, 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 the higher purpose that I'm, I'm looking to have an impact on. Right, because we could easily say, hey, we just want to solve Alzheimer's. We just want to solve um, changes in mild cognitive impairment. But really, a lot of these things are going to be comorbidities with one another. And if we are really only focusing on very minute or very focused problems to solve, it's probably going to be alienating for a lot of people. Because right? you want a DAO which is going to be including like people who are into product, people who are researchers, people who are reviewing deals, people who are understanding finance and operations, because these are all the people that can come together to really make a healthy, sustainable organization work. Um, I've also done little like adaptions of the, of the, the canvases that are used for startups or lean canvas. Um, so one really great thing, the, the purpose, the community, the launch plan, your tokenomics. Also tokenomics is super important because if you're doing a launch of a token, you don't just want to launch a token and have this dumped on the market um, because then the, this will encourage a lot of pumping and dumping uh, of investors. But that's also part of the, the whole um, ecosystem, right? I mean, having speculation investors buy your token is also healthy. I mean, it shows that there's interest and it's also adding to the liquidity in the market. So. I'm, I'm really interested in how um, the concept of liquidity of Web3 tokens flows into decentralized science, because this is one of the, the high level uh, also ideas of DeSci, right? We, we oftentimes ask the question, why Web3? Why do you need a token? What is this actually doing? Why don't you just have a startup? Why are you creating a DAO? And DeSci, I believe, um, hits on a lot of points with actually very honest answers, um, as we'll show going through the rest of the, the talk. One of the, the things that is really great with whatever project you're working on is to be able to understand how to break down your very complex idea, your very complex challenge into easy to use sentences. So I was at an uh, accelerator in Berlin uh, a couple of years ago and they were, you know, we were really focused on thinking about the technology for our, our company idea but they were very focused on forcing us to stop thinking about technology, just focus on the value that that product could potentially bring uh, to the people in the world. And now I like to take this wherever I go with me, whether it's about neuroscience or whether it's about creating stories for uh, nine science projects. So if something exists, um, like for example, if water is existing, uh, and drinking water is possible, then life will emerge. Simple, you know, simple analogy. You can take that and then break it down into the, the persona of the users. So when we, th when we think about DAOs, we really have to think about community, about people. Um, if you're running a DAO, your purpose is to serve the community, right? Uh, in many ways, it's less about being a, a startup founder, and I, I feel like it's almost more about being like a, a politician. Uh, hopefully an honest politician who is taking over that responsibility because you feel a need and you want to take on that responsibility to serve the community, right? So for a lot of people in the DAOs, we're not just getting into this because we think it's going to be profitable to solve neurodegeneration. It's because my mom was going through dementia before she died. And other people in the DAO, they also have a lot of personal stories about how they think that they could impact brain health over the, the course of the next decade or 100 years to really improve that um, aging journey for, for other people so they don't go through the, the same challenges that we went through. And that then breaks us down into what products and what things we really need to build within the DAO. It's really combining trend mapping together with user stories and requirements. So just like from a very broad product perspective, you know, if you have a, a pulse on what's happening in your scientific field, then you can start to predict, much like we talked about with the technology tree, what solutions are gonna be required to solve the problem that you're trying to solve, right? We're going to need BCIs that can be used to measure brain health over the course of the day if we want longitudinal data. 
to understand brain health journeys, or it has to be done through an app or other, another assessment um, ability, capability. And I think what's really cool, at least for Cerebrum, and this is gonna be analogous for all the other bio DAOs, as we were hearing about with Filecoin and their AI strategy, as we build more and more data, we're going to have more and more ability to answer big questions that we have. Um, understanding the structure and function of the brain. You know, you've heard about the topic of whole brain emulation also quite a bit over the past couple of days. Um, if we can understand how the brain works really at scale, at a generalized scale, where we have data collection from different sources over different populations, then we're going to better understand how diseases evolve, how disorders evolve, how interventions can then be brought and how they have an effect on people. Um, this is really one of the the beautiful goals, the high level goals I have for Cerebrum DAO, that we can build an infrastructure which is helping us to solve these questions um, in a way that maybe wouldn't be possible in a research group that's like only focused in one country or that's only funded by you know, one body. So for example, you know, if the brain can be measured, then people can measure themselves, right? I can step on my scale in the morning, my withing scale, I can see my general trend in weight, I can make an analogy if I'm getting healthier or not. I can't do that with my brain. Sometimes like, I'll just crash because I've been working too hard. I had no real way to predict that. But if I have a brain health assessment app, which is helping me understand my natural trends, I can lead a, a better brain health existence, a journey. Um, and this is what we're starting to build into our product roadmap in Cerebrum. So understanding how we need to characterize brain health over time is one of the most important things that I think we're going to be bringing out over the next uh, quarter. So building product roadmaps for the DAO, like it, it's again, so easy to get caught up in the concept of launching a coin and having a treasury. The really important thing is to understand what you're doing today, what you're doing tomorrow, and how that's going to impact you know, the, the next quarter. So really understanding the members of the DAO is key. Right now at Cerebrum, we're kicking off an internal user research uh, initiative, where we're going to be bringing together understanding of brain health, how people in the DAO view brain health, because we really under, want to know um, when we bring out interventions and products to them, how these are going to be accepted. We want to understand how they view brain health right now, why they're in the organization, and this is really going to also help to drive engagement. Because when you're talking to all the people in the DAO, and not just doing it you know, in a Telegram group to say, hey, the token price is up, you know, this, this is really great, we're growing as a community. But to really help them understand uh, why they're there and what they're gonna get out of this in a year or two years or three years, this is what we really want to focus on right now. Because if we don't do that, I don't think we're going to have the cohesive enough cohesiveness where people are staying engaged in the DAO and really helping to support our mission. So, um, going to dive into implementation. Uh, so anyone who's worked in like product development or other types of research or startups has probably gone through similar stages of going from idea to solution. Right? First you do your research, you ideate, you imagine what could be possible, how you're going to solve a problem like neurodegenerative disease. Then you start to build, prototype, test, iterate, and eventually hopefully deploy. Um, these are tools that are like really essential for, for DAOs, especially I think with science DAOs where you might be working with people who are coming primarily from the research field. They're really good at doing research, evaluating you know, minute uh, pieces of literature and understanding you know, how uh, a molecule is affecting the brain or the body. But it's really great to bring in um, workshops and different tools, different design tools so that we all have like a more common language when we're talking about stuff in an organization. And that again is also true for startups and small companies, large companies, and with networked organizations like the DAO, I think it's going to be incredibly important. Um, kicking off any project like this, you have to expect to go through a lot of emotional uh, challenges, right? If you start a company, if you start a team, if you start any movement, you go through a stage of forming, then they call it storming, then norming, and hopefully performing. Uh, so if you get into this, really think about your emotional journey. Expect to be in conflict at different points in time, especially with DAOs, because let's be honest, since these are networked organizations, 
you're probably going to be doing a lot of stuff remotely. Hopefully, you'll do uh, you know a lot of in-person meetings as well, like workshops and whatnot. But it's so easy to misunderstand one another when you're just talking over Discord or doing Google Meets. And if you understand that, if you you prop your mind for it, then you're not going to be um, as hurt <laughs> when when uh, people don't come to your point of view or when uh, they feel like they're being attacked by you uh, just because you're sharing your ideas in a certain type of way. And I like to think about it more as like inspiration, trying, expanding, requirements, and then shipping. So I always think, think about this from more of a product perspective rather than a science perspective, even though I have a PhD. Um, because I've seen that when we are working in different organizations, um, and, and there's other occupational, um, psychological, approaches to think about this. But you know, many times people can break down the personalities into different ways. I think the, the, the talker, thinker, doer concept is really cool because I feel like it's, it's not super complex, right? You can do a lot of super complex personality uh, tests and then you can see how you match to other people. But when I'm in different teams and depending on you know, if I'm happy or, or I'm tired or, or whatever, I feel like I go through different, take on different roles, right? Sometimes it's more of a methodology, you know, thinking role, just trying to map out stuff and not really wanting to talk to people. Sometimes you just want to focus on doing and prototyping and making. And sometimes, you know, you just want to talk. But all these things come together at different points in the DAO, right? Talkers, just like founders, are really great for pushing out the message. The people in the background who are thinking about the architecture are super important because they're the ones that are really understanding, hey, this is what we actually have to build to make that great idea a reality. And you can also think about it as a coordinator, ideator, implementer. Um, and I think it's probably really healthy when you start to think about this in a team structure to, to go through this type of exercise and think about, you know, what are you as a person? Because this then ultimately flows very nicely into the roles and responsibilities that you're going to need in the DAO and putting people at the most effective place in the DAO so they can do the best work. So currently, uh, at Cerebrum and also in a lot of other DAOs because, you know, for the most part, all the DSI DAOs look to Vita DAO. Everyone will say, hey, did you talk to this person in Vita DAO? They really know how to do deal flow or governance proposals or setting up the treasury. Um, traditionally, we have a legal structure in a DAO, right? Like a, a DAO itself is not, it has no real legal binding in, in any jurisdiction that I know of. In Switzerland, you can very easily set up a foundation, which can act as the legal basis for the DAO. And then the DAO itself can be tied to that organization. But if you're doing NDAs for deal flow analysis, for example, if you're setting up a bank account, right, that's all going to go through the, the legal foundation. Uh, then we break things down into our core team or core stewards. And these are the people who are day by day, week by week. Um, they're doing a lot of the organization and, and work of just keeping the, the structure of the DAO together. And right now, since we um, were launching, we're now bringing in other people to all these organizations so that we can start to engage and have more people working and doing great stuff. Um, community engagement, uh, science lead is really important because, again, when we're looking at deals or when we're looking at products, we want to do it from a scientific foundation and not just say, oh, hey, you know, if we develop this brain app, then that's going to solve all our problems and we can characterize brain health. Well, to a certain extent, it could if it has the, you know, the right brain health assessment built into it and it's already been validated through clinical trials. Um, governance, and now, you know, I, I think myself sort of as an architect, I'm trying to think about the structures that we need in the DAO and then implement this through uh, product development. And then at the end, again, the, the DAO participants in the Discord or the token holders, these are the people who are really there um, that you're serving them, right? Uh, and I think this is super important. It's going to be more and more important going, going forward. So at Cerebrum, uh, Cerebrum was started by Brian and Liva. Um, Marina and myself had joined a little bit after that. And it, I'm always, I don't even know how I got to know Brian originally. I think it was through Twitter or something on LinkedIn. And that's also one of the cool things about meetups like this, like getting to know people, uh, seeing what other people are working on, and then building out new projects. You know, there's uh, meetups in, in Europe, like DSI Berlin and DSI London, where people have met, you know, two years ago, uh, and then they formed a DAO, like Athena DAO, for example, they, they, they just met two years ago, and then they kicked off their project, and now they've 
gone forward and started to build out their, their uh, strategy. Also, Yatan, Heloise, you know, we bring together people who are doing core operations and also deal analysis and really forming out a, a nice team. So um, just some of, some of the mechanics. We did a, the neuron token launch. Uh, there are 86 billion neurons in the human brain, and we have an equal number of tokens in our treasury and our liquidity. So we launched on the BioXYZ platform. Uh, BioXYZ, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. They're led by Molecule. It's a company uh, organization in Berlin, which is building a platform for launching a lot of uh, bio DAOs like this. So we did a token sale. 5% uh, of the tokens were, were offered on the XYZ platform. And it was pretty successful. Um, raised like, yeah, 327 West, East. Um, we definitely raised enough money to now kick off operations, so it's about 1.2, 1.3 million. And now we're working on you know, setting up the, the financial plan and the budgets for how the different parts of the DAO, like the product development area, the deal flow area, are all going to distribute these funds. Um, we also work quite a bit on governance. So the governance framework of the DAO is, I mean, this is the core of the DAO. This is why a DAO is a DAO. How are you making proposals? If you want to create a new um, product organization within the DAO, you have to present this to the, to the DAO them, themselves. People have to vote on it. Um, and the way we do it at Cerebrum, we write up a governance proposal. It goes through a, a first discussion on Discord where you can discuss the proposal. And then if there's no serious questions, it can go on to a snapshot. So there's a snapshot vote. And then the people who have the tokens, uh, they can vote directly on the, on the platform. And this has worked reasonably well. I mean, we, we had a few discussions on some of the proposals, but overall I would say it's been moving relatively uh, smoothly. So now that we uh, have this token sale and everything's approved, we then went onto a uh, DEX platform, so on Uniswap, and that's where a lot of the, the DSI projects are right now. You know, if you're really into tokenomics, you can imagine that a lot of these projects have market caps of like 5 million, 10 million, if you're like getting above 40 million, then I think it's pretty big for a DSI project at this point in time. But they're also primarily not on central exchanges. So I'm also looking forward to the time when we also have more liquidity and are then bumping up the, the price because then we can do more cool stuff within the DAO. And if we think about the, 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 all the money that's flowing into the crypto market right now, I think we're at like, what, $3 trillion total market cap, there, thereabouts. I don't know the, the current one today. You know, if we can put part of this liquidity into science projects, this is a huge opportunity. You know, it's an it's a opportunity maybe larger than many countries where we can put, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars into these DSI projects and we can make science also essentially a tradable asset, which is essentially why the IP NFT is created because then you have that entity which can live on the blockchain and can be traded. And it's a new concept because traditionally science is about um, just creating knowledge and understanding, and then only later is it being um, put onto the market by launching a company or doing a patent. So in the first part, we really focus on deal sourcing because we wanted to show, hey, we are bringing in money, and now we're already making this impact. And again, if we think about the total impact that DAO is going to have, those deals that we're making. Um, those are going to be long-term um, yeah, long projects to get a return. So five, eight years. And a lot of the challenges we have right now are just bringing in more people to the DAO and doing things like increasing our deal evaluation team so we can evaluate deals faster, talking to technology transfer offices, doing a lot more outreach. So a lot of it is really right now on the ground work, you know, talking to people, sharing about what Cerebrum is doing, and then bringing on new stakeholders into the, into the platform and also people are doing, uh, doing work. Now we talked a lot about uh, this idea of the knowledge graph in the earlier part of the talk. And this is like a huge challenge for any organization, but it's so cool what's happening right now with large language models and agents, D AI agents, DSI agents. Um, we're working with Coordination Network. Uh, this is a company also based out of Berlin they essentially are hooking up a large language model to a nice user interface so that you can really deep dive into different problems. 
So for example, when we have new deals coming into the, the deal flow process, we can take that opportunity, we can put it into, the, into their uh, tool, and then we can start to see what they think the, like how risky that project is gonna be. Or if we're, we want to research an opportunity, we can essentially use an AI agent in their platform, which has been trained uh, by the people in our DAO to do a literature survey, a literature review. Right, because if you do a literature review of like a very particular part of a you know, scientific area, there's a process to go through. But if you train the, the agent or the LLM how to do that properly, then it's going to give you good results. I mean, if you just throw stuff into ChatGPT, it's, yeah, maybe it'll be right, probably it won't give you the, the feedback that you want. So it's really amazing how these new tools are coming out. In our, because in our deal flow process, we'll bring in new deals, we'll pre-qualify the deal, we'll say, oh, is this really, fulfilling the purpose of the DAO, if it works out or not. And then we go through an expert review panel, and then we start to have meetings with the companies and really, or researchers, uh, and really understand if this is something which makes us for us to invest in, and if the investment that we can do in that project is really going to take it to the next level. So we did quite a bit of work in looking at defining different uh, categories for the proposals and the opportunities that are being evaluated. And then connecting this with the risk, because you know, we don't want to have just like super risky products uh, or projects. We want to understand the risk benefit that we're going to be getting out of these uh, opportunities should they be funded. So we're still working on creating the landscape for this, but I think it's super important to, to think about that. Because if you haven't been evaluating uh, deals or you haven't been in a VC process, which I was not in a VC process before, but it's very analogous to it, right? Because you're coming in, uh, people are bringing in opportunities, and then you have to think about is this really going to make sense or not. But here, you know, it's not just about having uh, a return on the investment, it's will this really help brain health, will this really help neurodegeneration? Because all these things, they could also be great companies or great ideas, but if they're not fulfilling the purpose of the DAO, it's just not gonna make sense for us to, to invest in. So the deal execution team has really been focused on looking at Therapeutics, diagnostics, uh, also consumer neurotech, uh, also looking at some brain, actually tissue replacement ideas. So there, there's been like a wide range of opportunities coming in, which you know some of them are things where if they get funded, they could have an impact in a year as a diagnostics tool. Other things, they probably wouldn't come to market for you know 15, 20 years. Uh, so we're really looking at that broad view again, not just thinking about trying to do something that's going to have an exit in a couple of years, but something that's going to have really long-term value coming back. And we really look into the scientific rigor of the of the deal. So, it, you know, it, sometimes people think about crypto, and you know, it's like a um, like a concept out there where oh, we know a lot of money is coming into something, but we don't know exactly what that means. And for us, it's super important to not just think about the flow of deals coming in, but really to focus on, is this a scientifically valid concept or idea? And then really talk to the researchers and understand exactly what, what, what that's gonna do for us. And one of the, the first projects that we funded together with VitaDAO, uh, Fission Pharma, they're basically looking at how mitochondrial uh, dysfunction can lead to inflammation and different diseases. Because also in the brain and also in different parts of the body, if we can understand the mitochondria, reduce inflammation, we can also address different areas of um, aging and comorbidities. So this is something, uh, it was really great to bring it through the, the deal flow process. And again, people can then see exactly, hey, this is what we're building, this is what we're working on. We also just uh, got snapshot approval for the product working group. Uh, this is, I think, maybe a little bit new for some of the DAOs, and I'm not sure how many other DAOs have also product working groups coming out who came from the traditional um, funding area. So the, the goal of this product working group is going to be to bring together people who are just going to focus on brain health products and interventions that can be brought out to the DAO or actually developed inside of the DAO, right? Because we have capabilities for hardware and also software, and we can really build out a product roadmap, which is going to allow us to bring in things like um, stimulation devices for the eyes, which are, for example, going to have a background in long-term brain health or acoustic stimulation or supplements. And we're taking the same scientific rigor that we would take to normal deal flows to understand exactly how these things are going to impact brain health and if it makes sense to bring them out to the, to the DAO or not. 
But the cool thing is that these are things that people can engage with like over the next quarter or over the next year, right? These are things where people can get engaged with the product roadmap that we're bringing out. They can give feedback to it and they can directly imagine how those products are going to be impacting them in the short and near term. The other cool thing is really coming back to data. Data, agents, and really building new knowledge within the DAO. So I, I also have a background in wearable sensors. I don't just wear them, I also uh, have been developing them. And one of the key things that we want to bring out till the end of the year is first a brain health assessment application as a mobile app. This is gonna be in partnership with a company that's been developing it already. This will allow people to essentially do a brain assessment to start getting that baseline measurement for their brain health at different points in time. It's also gonna take in their wearables data because we know there's a lot of uh, synergy between movement, sleep, brain health, recovery. Like all these things, I feel like we can understand them. We just don't have a system yet which allows us to get this holistic view of a person's uh, life. The other part of this, I want to have a aspect which is bringing in data either from other DAOs or other research institutions, right? We, we've talked about, you know, if we use Filecoin, for example, to collect a lot of brain data or health data, that can be accessed through an API. That can then be used to understand how interventions are impacting brain health. And if we really start to build efficacy for different interventions within the DAO, this is a huge long-term value because it, sh it will show that the that the power of using network organization to do these distributed trials or to do this distributed data collection can really have a, a great impact, not just for, for brain health, but also as a model for, for other organizations. And bringing out a brain health journey, like a really a way for people to understand where they are and their brain health journey at their point in life, I think is also gonna really help to contextualize for a person where they are and what impact this um, interaction with the DAO is having on them. We're also building out concepts for really, you know, not just thinking about that at a, a high level, but really thinking about how, what are the me mechanics going to be. So for example, when you have a token, you can do governance, right? But you can also stake that token. That token can be a way to get a reduction on interventions or apps that are being brought out to a brain health marketplace. We can use an exchange of tokens to reward people for putting their brain data onto our platform and to really monetize and have a long-term value for it. Now these are concepts that have also been you know, worked on in other startups. I think that through the, the, the power of DSI, we're getting to a point where there's a lot of different organizations that are working on solving specific problems. For example, Data Lake is focused on solving the problem of connecting patient data to companies. Uh, we know there's a lot of open data out there that we can access, like UK Biobank. Like it's, there's so much potential to build this into a platform which can have this long-term understanding of brain health um, that we're super excited to, to start building it. And this is part of what the product working group is about, building out that roadmap and then starting to build out, you know, what are the resources that are gonna be needed? What's the budget that's gonna be needed? And then taking a more traditional, let's say company building or startup approach to then bringing out those interventions. So the DSI engagement, um, I'm gonna go back now and then think about the knowledge and access. So I think like a really central part to make DSI work and be successful over the long time period is rethinking how we're accessing data. And really it's gonna come down to large language models and agents working in between different DAOs. You know, we started at a point where we had hypertext documents, we could use Google, we could search for documents, we would have to uh, pull out knowledge from that information that we found we have to do like a lot of uh, searching and pulling. Now we're getting to the point where I think DAOs fundamentally are going to be great places for domain specific knowledge and ground truth. This is really key because like the organization itself is a decentralized organization that can bring in a lot of people from different areas. And we want to get to the point where different DAOs have knowledge graphs and APIs that are talking to one another. And now if you talk to people who are really thinking about like the DSI in like 20 or 30 years, the, you know, the vision is that we have wet labs running in one country and maybe the, the funding to do an experiment was captured in another part of the world and then they do a token exchange to start running their, you know, thousand assays and experiments in the wet lab that's been set up just to do DSI experiments. 
right? And when, you know, we might develop biomarkers in Cerebrum that could also be used by VitaDAO. Maybe we can bring these two things together to develop a, a new product. You know, th this is one of the visions that we have for the future and why we think about DSI as like really automating science. And I don't really think about it as uh, replacing scientists. I think about it as just improving our ability to make an impact on the world. Now to do this, again, we need the infrastructure. We need things like Filecoin for decentralized file storage and be able to grow and, and expand it. And we've also been building out a lot of ideas for larger infrastructures where we're trying to say, okay, if we want to build these DAOs, what are the things that have to be there? And I think, we you know, we already talked about like deal flow, tokenomics, community, but the knowledge app is going to be, I think, so incredibly central, especially for DAOs, because they're decentralized by nature. People aren't always in the same room. And you have to have an app which really understands all the information that you're talking about day by day in the DAO. And this, of course, goes back to the tech tree. Uh, the tech tree as a knowledge graph is a way where we validate the, the scientific knowledge inside the DAO, because these are the ones that have been thought about, also potentially created by humans, by people inside the DAO, and check them and double check them. Then having retrieval and creating a, a RAG application, you know, now this is actually relatively straightforward. A lot of the stuff we already started thinking about you know, a year ago, but it's becoming easier and easier to build out your RAG app, build out your um, centralized knowledge database, build a vector database, use a foundational model, could be ChatGPT, could be Llama, could be one of the other multitude of LLMs coming out, or you could just start retraining that model for your specific uh, knowledge base within the DAO. And this, I think, is going to be super cool because that's really going to be a tangible thing created inside the DAO, which can be done with a lot of distributed systems. Um, and it, you know, it's not going to require like a lot of physical design or you know, physically making products. And of course, you know, companies are also going to be needing this in the future. So I think DSA organizations can really be a model for how to do this um, right now from the ground up. Because um, they already are in that, you know, we already do all the research, right? We research a problem, we pull the PDFs, we pull in all the knowledge we need for our literature review, we combine with a foundational model, and then we build a custom chat model. Um, this is also going to be, I think, really critical for brain health with Cerebrum in general, because understanding brain health is such a complex thing. Understanding what, um, what actions to take, what foods to eat throughout the day, and how that actually affects your brain health I think this is going to require the combination of actionable data from people plus wearables data to understand the context of a person. I'm going to talk a bit more about this on Friday in my presentation. But then building this together with AI agents, which uh, are by design pulling in different tools like the biomarkers that we've created at Cerebrum, or it's going to go talk to the API at VitaDAO or AthenaDAO. It's going to start creating um, really self-creating solutions where we're, you know, I really look towards this future where we have the AI scientist, which is helping us to either do the science itself or just work through understanding what solutions we should be working on, where we should be putting funding, how we should be, you know, approaching these very complex, very multimodal problems. So I'm very happy to like be here because a lot of people are also talking about this. AI agents on chain, AI agents that can work and live within a, a person's um, phone, for example, or eventually on their, on their device. I think that there's so much potential to build out DSI um, structures that are going to be automating so much of the stuff and not doing it to replace us, just doing it so we can do science better. Now, the key things are gonna be needed. Uh, the knowledge graph, obviously the purpose and focus, right? If you don't you know, like have the very specific purpose for the DAO, you're probably not going to be doing the, the trial design and really building the partnerships that are going to be needed. Uh, data and knowledge, like we've talked about, many easy ways to do this nowadays with Filecoin or with other uh, distributed systems. And obviously the community and, and the tokens and treasury, because those are things that make this whole thing happen. So I'm really looking forward in the future to be presenting what's uh, being created with knowledge apps for DSI. Very, very interested to collaborate with anyone on the architecture design of DSI apps, so we could also start to build out prototypes and start to also share them between the different DAOs, because I think this is so critical to making DSI really a sustainable reality now and also in the next couple of years. Um, really quickly, I want to not just talk about Cerebro, I want to talk about some of the other cool DAOs that are coming out there. 
Um, so WellShare, this is a, it's an app which is really focused on addressing the problem of uh, clinical trial recruitment and also pull, pulling together data so that you can combine Web3 together with clinical trials in a distributed way. Um, as I'm sure you know, there are many, there's a lot of uh, money going into clinical trials when you want to, when you have to find the right person, especially for if it's for a rare disease. You know, it can cost like thousands of dollars, tens of, tens of thousands of dollars to find the right person to even put into a clinical trial. So there's a lot of companies like WellShare that are really focused on helping to solve this problem. And, you know, very simply, they put together a platform where users can participate in medical research facilitated through their application. And then companies, pharma companies can work, come in, use this platform to help build the, these new uh, drugs and discoveries. So the, the reason they're using Web3, you know, they want to have for some confidentiality, they want to have secure data processing because we've seen this with a lot of these early companies, 23andMe for example, right? They had a data breach of human uh, genomic data, which was not great. Um, and now there's a DAO called Genomes DAO that's probably gonna take over all of the data from 23andMe and put it into their secure system. And then the ownership and monetization of the data I think is like so critical. I mean, we've been talking for, I don't know, probably almost a decade that you can access your patient records, that you can really own it, that you can share it and you can provide it to other companies or services to either build out new clinical trials or to provide new solutions for you personally. So I'm really excited that companies like WellShare are starting to bring this out. Um, so they're at a stage where they've been first building out the concept for the app. They're gonna be going towards a token launch at some point in the future and really then launching their DAO on, on the market. And I don't like to think about DSI as like something which is separate from the rest of the entire economy. I feel like it's something that should be embraced by researchers. It shouldn't be seen as a a competition to centralized funding. It should be an, an addition, a benefit. And in the same way, I don't think that pharmaceutical companies should see DSI projects as like a, a competitor, but rather as a partner to help create these, these new solutions and knowledge. And we've also seen that with some of the investments in uh, other companies like uh, VDDAO. So it's very easy to put together these numbers, you know, to show the purpose for why they, they want to go forward. And one of the ways that a lot of new DAOs are launching is through the, the, the BioXYZ platform. So this is a launch platform built by Molecule uh, in Berlin. Uh, they also have a Swiss foundation, if I remember correctly. And their basic thesis is that by the creation of research NFTs, funding of research, proceeds once we have um, exits of, uh, of NFTs, goes back into the, the DSI DAOs. So we have that basic mechanism for increasing the value in treasury, which leads to better and new solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, new DAOs that have been coming up over the past, so I think this started about two years ago, starting to launch them. So Athena DAO, Hair DAO, Psy DAO you might have heard of, uh, some of you are in Psy DAO. Uh, also Valley DAO and Cryo DAO, so it's really great to see this as a new funding mechanism to bring these, these new um, company ideas or DAO ideas to life. And you know the thesis of BioXYZ is that we want to really help to also de-risk some of these projects, right? Um, if pharma can't always put in the money required to do a lot of the, the product development, they're, they're also going to look towards startups or hopefully BioDAOs in the future to do a lot of that early discovery work and then take over and hopefully fund some of the projects. At least I think that's what I can imagine happening. Because I mean, you know, the pharma companies could also theoretically buy up tokens and a lot of DAOs to also have a governance position in them. And with, you know, the, the, the central thesis for the, the bio DAOs is really to address this valley of death. You're gonna see this like anytime you go to a DSI uh, presentation. Uh, going from early development to really understanding like what hit or what lead we need to develop around for a, for a pharmaceutical or molecule, for example. And then, you no, know, we hope to get to this point where there'll be large exits for some of these bio DAOs, because that, of course, if that happens, then it'll be like a complete validation that this is going to be possible and this will work. Uh, BioXYZ launched 2022. If you want, if you have a DAO idea, you can go talk to them. Uh, they have different cohorts where they will essentially bring you in through an accelerator program. And they're also gonna be working on setting up things like DAO tooling and really facilitating, helping people to, to build out their DAO projects. 
So you can see, think of them as a launchpad marketplace, um, stakeholders for helping all these different DAOs in all these different areas uh, get off the ground. But of course, you don't have to launch through, through BioDAO. Um, there's uh, other ways to do it through Pink Sale or a multitude of other Web3s. Uh, Molecule has also been building Catalyst. So I talked earlier about this idea of bringing liquidity into science. Catalyst is really about putting science onto a marketplace. You know, so one of the uh, ideas is that, hey, what if, what if you, have a, you start your PhD at Caltech or something? Uh, it looks like it's gonna be really cool. Hey, maybe I should put that on Catalyst because it could be a way to start funding and bringing uh, liquidity into a science project at a very early stage. Um, it's still a new concept. It just launched, I think, a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month ago. But it's, I'm really excited to see these new um, experiments coming out and understanding how we can really fuse Web3 crypto technologies together with science. So that's really you know, where the DSI journey has uh, come, has flowed, has evolved for me. I'm really focused on helping also uh, people to go from a DAO launch, building, releasing, and really championing the idea that the end goal of this is to create value for society. So that's what I think about every day when I'm working in BCIs or working on the Cerebrum DAO and thinking about neurodegeneration. What's the value that we can create right now to impact people's lives in the future? And I'm very happy uh, to talk later, have any more information, questions. Also, if you're interested in addressing uh, neurodegeneration, feel free to jump on the Cerebrum DAO Discord. Come talk to me. I'd love to have your points of view. Thank you very much.